Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us at Sotheby's. My name is Calvin Harvey, and I'm a specialist in the Old Master Paintings Department here. I'm thrilled to be sitting in front of this magnificent painting by Nicolas Largillier, recently restituted to the heirs of Jules Strauss. I'm joined by Pauline Baer, great-granddaughter of Jules Strauss, and the author of the book The Vanished Collection, which has just come out in English, and I have to say is wonderful. Thank so you. I'm thrilled to be talking to you about it today. Thank you, Kevin. I'm also joined by my colleague, Lucien Simmons, Vice Chairman at Sotheby's and Worldwide Head of Restitution. He's also a specialist in Impressionist and Modern Art. Thank you, Welcome, Kevin. Lucien. Thank you, Kevin. I'm very excited. I love the book, and Thank it's you. an honor to be able to be here with you and learn more about it and learn more about your great-grandfather, who really uh, was an incredible man, an incredible collector, uh, and had a, an eye like none other, really. I want to start by talking a little bit more about him and learning. Uh, it sounded to me in the book like you actually didn't know all that much about him when you started this journey. Uh, tell us a little bit more about what you learned and how he came alive for you. That's right. I knew almost nothing about him because in my family nobody talked about him. Um, it's my cousin Andrew Strauss who, who told me one day just like that, out of the blue, he said, oh, I think uh, our great-grandfather may have been looted during the war. And I said, okay, but tell me more about this great-grandfather, uh, what collector he was, and I had to learn all his story that never was told in my family. So I learned he was German, um, arriving in Paris by his 20s, starting a collection, an Impressionist collection first. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can tell you more right now about <laughs> his collection, but. Um, the interesting thing for me is that all his life he has been collecting, it got m much more important than his job in the bank. Mm -hmm. And uh, he collected Impressionist, but also uh, 17th and 18th century paintings, like this one. And he had a very horizontal uh, collection. It means that he was interested in um, a lot of different things. And I learned as well that he was a donator to the Louvre Museum, the Carnavalet Museum in Paris. And he was very fond of uh, provenance. Uh, he wanted to know everything about the um, paintings he collected that was important for him. It's amazing. It really comes through in your book how much of a scholar he was and how passionate he really was about his collection. Uh, Lucien, I know you are a specialist in Impressionist art and in restitution, so he must have been a big figure for you from your perspective. Uh, he he was. Um, Jules Strauss has always been a, a hero in the Impressionist art world. Um, the catalogues for sales in 1902 and 1932 uh, were used as reference books. They were in our Impressionist library, Sotheby's in London, and people would look at them as reference books, not because of Jules Strauss, but because his taste was so good and his collection was so amazing. And rereading your book, it reminded me that in the introduction to the 1902 catalog, uh, the scholar who introduced this amazing collection said, this was a collection that was all about quality and not quantity. He bought from the estate sales of, of Boudin and of uh, the other artists he collected, and he got the best of the best. And you could see that his various sales and his collection moved on and developed, and as you say, it was as a horizontal collection from um, porcelain to impressionist paintings, old masters, original furniture, but always the very best. And so he was just an amazing collector. And I think his passion comes through too in the fact that he was sort of, you know, buying and selling, adding to his collection uh, throughout the years. Although this painting was with him until, until the end. Um, he bought it in 1928. Uh, and then, as we'll talk a little bit further, it was um, in 1941 when it was, when it was sold. Um, in the book, Pauline, you take the reader on this gripping journey while you put together the provenance of not just this picture, but a number of pictures um, in his collection. And I know you were a writer before this, but this was a whole, new <laughs> a whole new genre of research that you took on. So tell us a little bit about how, how you approached that and, wh and what you did. Yeah, I was a complete beginner. Um, I knew nothing about art history or art or history. 
of the <laughs> Nazi looting. So I had to learn everything while doing the investigation. So, and I, I also had to learn how to search in archives. So I did it all in the same time and it was not easy, but I think I was driven by a huge curiosity. I, was, I realized I, I, I wasn't told enough and this, um, for me it was important really to learn what happened. There was some kind of a gap in my history, in my family, like sometimes you have gap, a gap mm -hmm. in provenance. I was doing my own provenance research actually while doing this work. Incredible. <laughs> Lucien, tell us a little bit more about the, the looting that was going on in Paris. This painting in particular was part of a forced sale, but it was. what other, you know, what was going on there? I, I should say every, every case is different and every story, every family's history is different. But a lot of them, particularly in Paris, have, have commonalities. So before the invasion of Paris in, in May 1940, the Germans were completely prepared. They had lists of the great Jewish collections and great Jewish collectors uh, who they would go to immediately they arrived in Paris and try and seize collections for the Nazi hierarchy, for museums and for resale. Uh, so Jules Streis was clearly on the list, uh, Alphonse Kahn was on the list, the Schloss collection yeah. was on the list, these great, great early 20th century collections. Um, so when the Germans arrived they set up a whole bureaucracy for dispossessing Jewish collectors particularly of their collections. So you mentioned in your, in your book the ERR, the Einsatzleiter Rosenberg, yes. um, which was a bureaucracy dedicated to taking fine art from Jewish collectors and enemies of the Nazi state and then streaming them into property for German museums, for Hitler, for Goering and as I said for resale. Um, there was also below that another whole bureaucracy which again you described beautifully in your book, the Mobile Action, which was an organization designed to strip mostly Jewish collectors and Jewish households of all the goods which were needed to replenish destroyed household goods in Germany, in German homes. So they take bed linen, furniture, carpets. Everything. Absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. Um, and you mentioned in your book again that Mobile Action were, were, were raiding the warehouse where Jules Strauss had, uh, and his wife had put their property. And again, that was very common. And uh, with this particular painting, there was a third stream that people uh, like the Strausses uh, had lost their means of support. They probably lost their income. They'd been dispossessed of their first apartment, had to move to a smaller apartment, and then another apartment again. And in that process, they had nowhere to put their property, and they sold things at undervalue, basically because people knew that they were desperate and had to sell. Um, and then the last category, which is, which is the most tragic of all, um, many people lost their property through what are called wild Aryanizations, where their neighbors would knock on the door and say, uh, Mr. Strauss, I, I know it, you, uh, you're short of money and you're, you're downsizing. Why don't you sell that to me? Why don't you sell that to me and I'll just give you cash? So neighbors would also dispossess people. So it was a whole environment which the Strausses lived through and it must have been truly terrible. So I just imagine that they were a respectable, uh, highly philanthropic, famous couple. Jules Strauss had donated frames to the Louvre. He was on first name terms with the academics, with art dealers, with the artists themselves, and he was reduced to having to sell things just to survive. So it was a terrible environment, and you can imagine this amazing painting it must have been such a wrench for him to sell, and you can see that it was this terrible environment that made him do so. Yeah, really was a, um, a multi pronged mm. attack. Absolutely. Uh, just incredible yeah, that's and why horrifying. It's a, it's a yeah. bit difficult to figure out. Uh, what happened exactly sometimes because of all the ways the things were looted mm -hmm. uh, but it was all a uh, way of erasing uh, Jewish identity and um, I learned a lot by reading the Ju anti-Jewish laws you know, they, they would lose their bank account uh, they would lose their right to be a citizen to work and so on so that's how I learned maybe what happened so when people thought oh maybe he was very happy to sell it or that's not the case, you know, they had no choice, obviously. 
uh, and even if he'd sold it, then the money would have gone into a bank account and the proceeds yeah. would have been blocked. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, so the, the, the money never blocked. arrived uh, sometimes, of course. So how in the end were you able to figure out that there was some sort of a forced sale that happened with this painting in particular? Um, it took me quite a long time. It took me like three years mm -hmm. to put all the evidence together because um, the museum wanted to have all the proof. What I have is, the, which is very precious in my uh, investigation, is the notebooks that belong to Jules Strauss that not all family have, and I'm lucky to have that. So um, he had these notebooks. He would write down all what belonged to him uh, until 40, 1941, and he died in 1943. Okay. So then I can say, okay, he still had it in 1941. And the, the Madame de Parabère, as he called her, <laughs> was there by mm -hmm. Largillière. Um, then I went to Coblence. Coblence is the uh, Mobile Action Archives. I went to uh, 20 different centers of archives and museums. So I put all the evidence together. And in the end, I found there was a lady who has a red flag name who got this painting. And she sold it to, uh, she was condemned afterward and after the Second World War in, in France, she was condemned. Mm -hmm. And she sold um, a lot of French artwork and paintings to the Reichsbank, uh, to the German Reichsbank. So that was the, the main proof I had. You found out that she was involved yeah, in exactly. the sale Yeah, exactly. She was here. involved right. and she was condemned for that. Mm -hmm. And it all so happened in about June 1941. Yeah, about, right? uh, about mm -hmm. that date. So. Yeah. That was a way, but it's true, uh, finding all the evidence of that time is long <laughs> and difficult. And I was lucky to have a lot of help from professional people doing research provenance from people in museums, in French Louvre archives. So it was very helpful. It's incredible what you did and you really take the reader on this gripping journey. Uh, it's a page turner reading it, finding out how you uncover all of this, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the things that really you know, struck me and, and continues to, to strike me in this business as we see restitutions happening, this was restituted to your family in 2021. Um, that's 80 years after 1941. And it was sitting in the museum in Dresden since 1959. Before that, it was in the Gamalda Gallery in Berlin. Why did it take so long? <laughs> That's a very you know, good question. Why, why mm. you know, and Lucina, you know, maybe you can speak to this as well, but, you know, why is it only now that we're starting or that it feels like some of these things are starting to come to light with the very, very hard and tireless work? I think work they knew it, like the, the, there was a gap in the provenance. They had a lot of uh, details about, they even had the name of Jules Strauss on their uh, Lost Art uh, mm -hmm. database. But I think they were looking, they were waiting for us to show the evidence, you know, instead of really doing themselves the investigation. Um, that's why it took a very long time. And they lacked a few informations. They could have come to France and investigate, but they, sometimes they can't. Mm -hmm. That's uh, maybe there are other explanations, but I don't want to go into polemic about that. But it's true that it's too long, and the, the more you wait, the, the most difficult it will get because uh, if we wait too much, the archives will get too difficult to find. The family we won't know anything anymore. I mean, I'm a great grandchild, but right. imagine in, in two, generation, it, two generations, it will be too late. Who will remember everything? Incredible. And, and certainly from, from my experience working in Sotheby's restitution department, it, it's taken a very long time for collectors, for the market, and for museums to realize that this is a continuing issue. And if you think about and the Gamalda Gallery in, in Dresden is, is a huge museum, and it took them far too long to understand the history of this work. But even in New York City, if you look at the museums here, they have millions of objects, and many of them have lost their history. They've lost their past, and it takes a lot of time to mm. reconstruct where things came from. Um, and actually, you say that it's, you know, as time goes on, it's harder. In a way, it's also easier, because so many archives are now digitized, and you can actually access things online more than you could when I started this role so 20 plus years ago. <laughs> so it is now easier yeah, in right a way that. that you can look. Um, but also I think the, the, the perception of 
restitution and displacement of artworks has changed. Uh, I think maybe 25 years ago, had somebody been told that this amazing painting was sold by Jules Strauss, they just said, well, he sold it. <laughs> yeah, the fine. idea of being forced yeah. under circumstance didn't yeah. really exist. Right. Uh, maybe. Correct. And I think now people are more willing to say, yeah, but what were the circumstances? Yes, he was clearly persecuted. He was downsizing mm. apartments. He probably exactly. lost his pension. His investments had disappeared, not just because of the recession, but also because of the war. Uh, he was in a terrible position. And people now say, well, that, that, that whole situation colors the transaction where he sold this painting, whereas before, maybe not. Yeah, things it's are changing. You're, you're right about that. Yeah. I can feel it when I talk to people in museums or to, to other research uh, people. Yeah. But um, no, I'm afraid the thing that is going to be, it's going to be a bit too late to ask the family. And that's really precious to ask your mm. own family because they always know much more. I have my uh, 96 uh, old year old <laughs> um, aunt and uh, she, without her I couldn't have done it, you know, because she was the one to remember everything, even though she didn't know it had been looted. Right. Because there was some kind of denial in my family. Maybe it was too painful, maybe they didn't want to speak about it. There was a certain shame of acknowledging what happened. But um, all you, you can find in your own family is the, the most precious source. Incredible. And I, and I think your book is amazing because it actually it tells that story and it stops it being forgotten. So the rest <laughs> of your, your younger members of your family or children will now know the story. And that's a really noble thing you've done. Oh, thank you it's so much. wonderful. But the thing is that not, not everything is solved. Someone mm. told me, but in your book, not everything is solved. How, how come? I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, I did my best, and there are st still things to, to solve. Yeah. But it's a uh, that's the way. It's a process, a never ending process. I, and I know that I will never get to know everything about it. Let's talk a little bit about the painting itself. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this painting is from uh, 1714. Nicolas de Largillière is one of the most important portraitists uh, of the time. Uh, it's thought to be Madame Parabère. We're not completely sure, but it's, she's in the guise of Pomona. I love the story. I, you know, I think that what, the way he's depicted it here in this composition is so animated and interesting and it's the moment where Vertumnus, who disguises himself as an old lady in order to come into Pomona's orchard, is revealed by Cupid, you know, so he's pulling off the mask. Uh, my favorite part, of course, though, is that she's, she doesn't look like a fool, you know, she's, <laughs> <laughs> she, Lars Julliard has given her this, this great confidence um, that looks d directly out to the viewer and I, I just can't stop looking at it, but Tell me, when you first saw an image of this painting and, and when you first saw it in person, mm. what was your reaction? It was quite a shock. <laughs> I was a bit overwhelmed because um, um, she, it was in the storage of the museum. Okay. And they told me, OK, you only have 10 minutes to look at it and you can take no picture, no photo, nothing. I said, OK, let's uh, try to <laughs> understand it mm -hmm. and to meet her. I have 10 minutes for that. Mm -hmm. So I just stood up. I was with my husband, who, who was a great help during the investigation. And I, I tried to look at her and say, OK, why did Jules choose you? What did he like in you? What, what happened that day? Please talk to You always <laughs> want the, the pictures to, to talk to you. Right. But I was amazed by her, her looks, you know? I wasn't expecting that because I see so many things in her eyes. I think she's smart and she's not naive and cute. And you know, there's something yeah. very strong in the way she looks like. And um, I found it very beautiful, actually. Yeah. It's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. It's powerful. It's, it it's is. a painting that sort of knocks you back. I'm, I, when it arrived here at Sotheby's, we were all just breath taken away. Uh, it's a really wonderful, wonderful the, the picture. The face is incredible, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the idea, the, the symbol of uh, everlasting youth, mm -hmm. everlasting love, is, is really nice, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I love all the fruit details. You, you can read it like a book. Calvin and I were discussing <laughs> it earlier. She has the figs next to her and the, and the, the bursting pomegranate. It's all very voluptuous. And, yes, it is. But mm. she's in control. That's why I like it. She's, mm -hmm. she's not a victim. She's, she's staring a at the viewer. Woman. She's powerful. <laughs> she's in control. And she has a presence all these years on. And, and you can also yeah. see why Jules Strauss might have collected it. You can see with 
with his other paintings, with his Impressionist paintings, this made sense. And as I mentioned earlier, in his 1902 catalogue, the scholars described him as collecting quality, not quantity. He clearly saw the quality here, and he saw that this made sense with furniture, with his porcelain, and with his Impressionist paintings. And I think the important thing for us is this carries the seal, the approval, the imprimatur of Jules Strauss. And I think his name and his appreciation adds to the painting. It adds to its importance. Absolutely. That's nice. Absolutely. It's just wonderful. And, and obviously, a museum quality masterpiece. It has been hanging in, in a great museum for many, many years. So it's, it's just, I've never seen a Largillier like it at Sotheby's. So it, it's going to be very exciting on Thursday. We're, we're looking forward to offering it. And it's been a treat this week to have it up here on view. One of the things I think I'd like to sort of finish on, and you touched on this a little bit, is, um, you know, from here, I, for me, it's been a real honor to be able to tell the story of the painting, of what you've done, of Jules' collection. Um, what advice would you have for other families that might be going through this, or other people? And I, you know, can ask both of you this question. But what, mm -hmm. you know, going from here, as we tell this story today, um, what comes to mind? Mm. I don't know if I can give any advice to others, but maybe just be curious, you know? If you want to know more about your family, just follow your path and, and go into the archives and ask everyone, and you, you will find help, you will, and follow your intuition, because nobody else can do the journey for you, you know? I felt that really there were a lot of, of nice coincidences during my, my journey and investi investigation. It's as it was me doing it, it was easier. I couldn't have asked any, anyone else, you know. I just, sometimes it was not logical nor mm -hmm. rational. I just followed my heart in a way. <laughs> so, okay, then now I have to look at that. And, and it was really like, as if everything was designed, so waiting for me to be solved. It was really strange. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I would uh, give that advice, follow your instinct, uh, ask the people around you. You know, the old aunts and uncle still alive, they say, oh, I don't remember. They always remember something useful. Mm -hmm. So ask them everything you can till they're, they're alive, when they're alive. Uh, go into the papers, the family papers. You will always fast, uh, you will find a letter or anything of value. So it's worth it. And uh, what else can I say? You can always find the answer. One answer. Maybe it's not what you were looking for, <laughs> but maybe it's an interesting answer. And you will learn about more, more about yourself doing that. Mm -hmm. Where you come from, uh, how was your family like. You will always learn something about yourself. It's an identity quest as well. What, what are you doing next? Are there more paintings you're in the midst of? Are you still spending a lot of time at the archives? I couldn't help but wonder as I was, you know, flipping to the end thinking, okay, you know, you, the Tiepolo drawing was mentioned in the book and, and this painting, there's a wonderful, wonderful chapter on that kind of nicely comes to a close, uh, but not everything mm. is closed. No, I, I think I will keep on being very curious and doing some research and investigation, but not at that rhythm and I don't have one painting in particular, I'm, uh, I have no claim going on. I just want to learn a little bit more about unsolved mysteries mm -hmm. uh, on my family, you know. There are a few gaps left. Um, there are a few paintings journey that I don't completely know, I haven't figured out yet. So I will keep <laughs> on, but not on the same rhythm. I think I'm happy of what's happening here. It's a nice uh, kind of accomplishment and I think it's, I've reached uh, a good uh, step in my, mm -hmm. in my research. <laughs> I mean, no, the only thing I'd add, and I, really, I think your book has done such a wonderful job of bringing back Jules Strauss's legacy. And his legacy yeah. is his name. Um, it's the aesthetic that he instilled into Michelle Strauss, who I was lucky enough to work oh. with for many years. His grandson, who worked in Sotheby's in London. A and passing it down through your family. So his story is not forgotten. And it's the story that's important. And it's, it's the legacy and the roots 
that he brings to your family. And I think your book is amazing the way it's brought that out. Well, thank you for saying that because I think it's the most important for me. It's the transmission yeah. and not forgetting it. I agree. So and, and you did a wonderful job. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely <laughs> wonderful. It's thank great. You. Well, Pauline's book is now out in English and in French, wherever books are sold, I assume. <laughs> yes. And um, we're very excited that this painting is here at Sotheby's. And if you are in New York, please do come visit us to see this painting. It'll be on view today until 5 p.m. and tomorrow all day. And Thursday morning is the auction. It will be live streamed uh, all around the world. So we're very <laughs> excited about it. And we hope you'll watch us there as we see the next chapter in this yeah. beautiful painting. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.